Hi, it's Nicole. I mostly talk about English classics on this channel, but I do read some non-classic works and I do have some favorites among these. I was thinking how to define non English classics for the purpose of this video. It's a complicated debate what's considered a classic. I heard it once somewhere that we can only start to consider whether a book is classic or not after it has been published and tested by time for at least 50 to 100 years. I enjoy reading novels from the 1930s, 40s and 50s and I'd like to be able to call them more than classics so I usually take the 50 years definition. I limited my choices for this video from books that were published within the last 24 years, that is since 2000. It's just a neat range. Though I have to sadly exclude some excellent titles like Sophie's World, House Moving Castle and Poor Things, for example. In addition to being able to talk about something more recent, I'm also glad this takes us to other countries around the world. I'll only cover novels in this video. When I looked through my spreadsheet, to my surprise, in the past few years, I read and enjoyed a lot of non-fictional titles from the 21st century. I might do a separate video for those. So, my five favorite fictional titles that are published in the past two decades are 2005 Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro, 2008 The Three Body Problem by Liu Cixin, I got the Chinese version here. 2009 Wu Ho by Hilary Mantel. 2014 Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. And 2020 Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Jia Zi. I haven't included the Harry Potter books, I love those obviously. I'm sure I missed some others too, but these are my favorites for today's video. These five books are not old enough to be classics in the sense we just talked about, but I do believe these are classic in another sense, that they are excellent and I hope people will still be reading them in 50, 100 years time. <laughs> Because these are some of my favorite novels, I care that if you ever get to read them, you have an unspoiled reading experience. So I want to say little about the plot. I've been thinking how to introduce them to you. Um, I think I will read the first page or a few paragraphs from the early part of each novel so you can get a feel of it. If it's intriguing, you can carry on reading yourself. If you do, please let me know. I'd be delighted to hear. If you've read any of the novels and you'd like to leave a comment about them, for the love of reading, please don't put any spoilers in. Thanks in advance for everyone else. Um, so grab a cup of tea, let me read you my favorite stories. First of all, Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. I'm sure a lot of you have read this one. Never Let Me Go is a novel by British author Kazuo Ishiguro, published in 2005. It's one of those books I would give much to be able to read for the first time again. I also so wish I hadn't watched the film before I read it. So if you haven't watched the film and you like a quiet but impactful book, I envy you. <laughs> what a treat. Do not read blurb or reviews or its Wikipedia page. Stay away from the film. It's an excellent film, but keep it for later. When I said I don't want to spoil the novels, I specifically have this one in mind. Some books you can enjoy even knowing the ending, like Wu Ho. It's history, we already roughly know what happened. But this one is one of those that can be spoiled spectacularly and that'll be a crying shame. So I'm not going to tell you anything beyond the first page or so, which I'm going to read you now. <laughs> My name is Kathy H. I'm 31 years old and I've been a carer now for over 11 years. That sounds long enough, I know, but actually they want me to go on for another eight months until the end of this year. That'll make it almost exactly 12 years. Now I know my being a carer so long isn't necessarily because they think I'm fantastic at what I do. 
there are some really good carers who've been told to stop after just two or three years. And I can think of one carer, at least, who went on for all of 14 years, despite being a complete waste of space. So I'm not trying to boast, but then I do know for a fact they've been pleased with my work. And by and large, I have too. My donors have always tended to do much better than expected. Their recovery times have been impressive, and hardly any of them have been classified as agitated, even before fourth donation. Okay, maybe I am boasting now, but it means a lot to me being able to do my work well, especially that bit about my donors staying calm. I've developed a kind of instinct around donors. I know when to hang around and comfort them, when to leave them to themselves when to listen to everything they have to say, and when just to shrug and tell them to snap out of it. Anyway, I am not making any big claims for myself. I know carers working now who are just as good and don't get half the credit. If you are one of them, I can understand how you might get resentful about my bed seat, my car, above all, the way I get to pick and choose who I look after. And I am a Hailsham student which is enough by itself sometimes to get people's backs up. Kathy H, they say, she gets to pick and choose, and she always chooses her own kind. People from Hailsham or one of the other privileged estates. No wonder she has a great record. I've heard it said enough, so I'm sure you've heard it plenty more, and maybe there's something in it. But I'm not the first to be allowed to pick and choose, and I doubt if I'll be the last. And anyway, I've done my share of looking after donors brought up in every kind of place. By the time I finish, remember, I'll have done 12 years of this, and it's only for the last six they've let me choose. And why shouldn't they? Carers on machines. You try and do your best for every donor, but in the end, it wears you down. You don't have unlimited patience and energy, so when you get a chance to choose, of course you choose your own kind. That's natural. There's no way I could have gone on for as long as I have if I had stopped feeling for my donors every step of the way. And anyway, if I'd never started choosing, how would I ever have got close again to Ruth and Tommy after all those years? But these days, of course, there are fewer and fewer donors left who I remember. And so in practice, I haven't been choosing that much. As I say, the work gets a lot harder when you don't have that deeper link with the donor. And though I'll miss being a carer, it feels just about right to be finishing at last, come the end of the year. Ruth, incidentally, was only the third or fourth donor I got to choose. She already had a carer assigned to her at the time, and I remember it taking a bit of nerve on my part. But in the end, I managed it. And the instant I saw her again at a recovering centre in Dover, all our differences, while they didn't exactly vanish, seemed not nearly as important as all the other things. Like the fact that we'd grown up together at Hailsham, the fact that we knew and remembered things no one else did. It's ever since then, I suppose, I started seeking out for my donors, people from the past. And whenever I could, people from Hailsham. There have been times over the years when I've tried to leave Hailsham behind, when I've told myself I shouldn't look back so much. But then there came a point when I just stopped resisting. It had to do with this particular donor I had once in my third year as a carer. It was his reaction when I mentioned I was from Hailsham. He'd just come through his third donation. It hadn't gone well, and he must have known he wasn't going to make it. He could hardly breathe, but he looked towards me and said, Hey Ocean, I bet that was a beautiful place. Then the next morning, when I was making conversation to keep his mind off it all, I asked where he'd grown up. He mentioned some place in Dorset, and his face beneath the blotches went into a completely new kind of grimace. And I realized then how desperately he didn't want to be reminded. Instead, he wanted to hear about Hey Ocean. So over the next five or six days, I told him whatever he wanted to know, and he'd lie there, all hooked up, a gentle smile breaking through. He'd ask me about the big things and the little things, about our guardians, 
about how we each had our own collection chests under our beds, the football around us, the little path that took you all around the outside of the main house, round all its nooks and crannies, the duck pond, the food, the view from the art room over the fields on a foggy morning. Sometimes he'd make me say things over and over, things I'd told him only the day before. He'd ask about like I'd never told him. Did you have a sport pavilion? Which guardian was your special favorite? At first, I thought this was just the drugs, but then I realized his mind was clear enough. What he wanted was not just to hear about Hailsham, but to remember Hailsham, just like it had been his own childhood. He knew he was close to completing, and so that's what he was doing, getting me to describe things to him, so they'd really sink in. So that maybe during those sleepless nights, with the drugs and the pain and the exhaustion, the line would blur between what were my memories and what were his. That was when I first understood, really understood, just how lucky we'd been. Tommy, Ruth, me, all the rest of us. Kathy goes on reminiscing about her childhood and her school days, her friendship with Tommy and Ruth. It sounds like ordinary childhood, girls hanging out in packs, watching boys playing sports, but the author subtly drops hints along the way, like the fourth donation and completing in the passage we just heard. We don't think much about it because we are carried along by the smooth and quiet narrative of the story, but things don't quite add up and we realize gradually this is not quite an ordinary childhood. And at the end, the novel doesn't just tell a moving story, it asks crucial questions about life and being human. And it does it by weaving the questions through a young woman's life story. It sounds very grand and abstract, questions about life and being human, but the author brings the issue close to my heart because by the end of the novel, it's not about an abstract subject, it's about the happiness of Kathy, and I have got to know and love Kathy and her friends. I thought I knew what my answer would be, but after I read the novel, I'm not quite sure anymore. It's thought-provoking and it changed my thinking. It's amazing when a book can do that. The Three Body Problem is a novel by Chinese author Liu Cixin, published in 2008. It's the first book in the three-part series. I'm going to read you the beginning from the Chinese version, which is slightly different to the English translation, the English version has different chapter orders to the Chinese version, but it's okay, it doesn't spoil anything. <laughs> so let me read you this. The Frontiers of Science. Wang Miao thought the four people who came to find him made a rather odd combination. Two cops and two men in military uniforms. If the latter two were armed police, that would be somewhat understandable, but they were actually PLA officers. As soon as Wang saw the cops, he felt annoyed. The younger one was all right, at least he was polite, but the other one, in plain cloth, immediately grated on him. He was thick-set and had a face full of bulging muscles, wearing a dirty leather jacket, smelling of cigarettes, and speaking in a loud voice. He was exactly the sort of person Wang despised. Wang well, Miao! <laughs> The way the cops addressed him by name only, so direct and impolite, made Wang uncomfortable. Adding to the insult, the man lit a cigarette as he addressed him, without even lifting his head to show his face. Before Wang could answer, the man nodded at the younger cop, who showed Wang his badge. Having lit the cigarette, the older cop moved to enter Wang's apartment. Please don't smoke in my home. Wang said, blocking him. Oh, sorry, Professor Wang. The young police officer smiled. This is Captain Shi Qiang. He gave Shi a pleading look. Fine, we can talk in the hallway, Shi said. He took a deep drag. Almost half the cigarette had turned to ashes, and he didn't blow out much smoke. 
He inclined his head toward the younger police officer. You ask him then. Professor Wang, we want to know if you've had any recent contacts with members of the Frontiers of Science, the young cop said. The Frontiers of Science is full of famous scholars and very influential. Why can't I have contact with a legal international academic group? Look at the way you talk, Shi said. Did we say anything about it not being legal? Did we say anything about you not being allowed to contact them? He finally blew out the lungful of smoke that he had sucked in earlier, right in Wang's face. All right then, please respect my privacy. I don't need to answer your questions. Your privacy? You are a famous academic. You have a responsibility toward the public welfare. She threw away the butt and took out another cigarette from a flattened pack. I have the right to not answer. Please leave. Wang turned around to go back inside. Wait, Shi shouted. He waved at the young cop next to him. Give him the address and phone number. You can come by in the afternoon. What are you really after? Wang said, his voice now tinged with anger. The argument brought the neighbors, curious about what was happening, out into the hallway. Captain Shi, the young cop, pulled Shi aside and continued speaking to him in hushed, urgent tones. Apparently, Wang wasn't the only one annoyed by his rough manners. Professor Wang, please don't misunderstand. One of the army officers, a major, stepped forward. There's an important meeting this afternoon to which several scholars and specialists are invited. The general sent us to invite you. I'm busy this afternoon. We know the general already spoke with the head of the Nanotechnology Research Center. We can't have this meeting without you. If you can't attend, we'll have to reschedule. Shi and the young cop said nothing. Both turned and went down the stairs. The two army officers watched them leave and seemed to sigh with relief. What's wrong with that guy? The major whispered to the other officer. He's got quite a record. During a hostage crisis a few years ago, he acted recklessly without concern for the lives of the hostages. In the end, a family of three all died at the hands of the criminals. Rumor has it that he is also friendly with elements of organized crime, using one gang to find another. Last year, he used torture to obtain confessions and permanently disabled one of the suspects. That's why he was suspended from duty. Wang Miao suspected that he was meant to overhear the conversation between the officers. Maybe they intended to show him that they were different from that rude cop. Or maybe they wanted to make him curious about their mission. How can a man like that be part of the battle command center? The major asked. The general specifically requested him. I guess he must have some special skills. In any case, his duties are quite restricted. Other than public safety matters, he's not allowed to know much. Battle Command Center. Wang looked at the two officers, baffled. It's a wonderful work of hard science fiction, which means if you have a scientist mind, you particularly enjoy this one. But on the other hand, <laughs> I nearly failed math and physics in school, and I still loved it. <laughs> the science and technology elements are the foundation of the world building. The story exists, it's urgent and weighty, it's relevant to me because of the incredible credibility of the science and technology elements of this fictional world. Hard sci-fi is a category of science fiction characterized by concern for scientific accuracy and logic. The three-body problem is an actual physics problem. To put it very simply, <laughs> because of my lack of intelligence, not yours, a three-body problem exists when three celestial objects with similar mass are in close proximity. They orbit around each other in a random, unpredictable pattern. The English translation of the novel starts with the Cultural Revolution in China. A disillusioned scientist who, after seeing so much pain and suffering, decides humans are doomed and cannot save themselves. So she does something desperate and the result of her action 
takes us to the second setting, which is the current time, um, where the elite scientists, especially physicists of the world, come to the unlikely but undeniable conclusion that science is broken. As the scientists are busy puzzling it out, a policeman, which is so, is tasked with the investigation of the death of a series of scientists which are linked up by their involvement with a particular computer game, which takes us to the third setting, an alien landscape where the three-body problem becomes a matter of life and death. The three interacting settings lend itself fantastically to representation on screen. It's now a excellent TV series on Netflix. I don't feel as strong about this one, whether you should read the books before you watch the TV series, partly because I read the novels a few years ago. Um, I don't remember enough to get too annoyed about the adaptations of the details, but I know some friends are. And partly, maybe as a result, I think Netflix gets the vibe of the story pretty spot on. So it's more a case of, if you watch the TV series, I think there's little point reading the novels afterwards. However, my husband, who doesn't usually read, <laughs> read the whole series in English, thinks it's still worth reading the novels, even if you do watch it on screen, partly because it's rare to find such a brilliant series of sci-fi novels set in a non-Western culture. And that's an element that is sadly lost somewhat in the Netflix series. The original story has a Chinese protagonist and it's set in China. Netflix sets it mostly in the UK and shares the plotline among a few non-Chinese protagonists. The excellent English translation by Ken Liu was published in 2014. Just in case my word is not enough to convince you, that translation was the first novel by an Asian writer to win a Hugo Award for Best Novel. The third and last book of the Three Body series was shortlisted for Hugo Award for Best Novel as well. And Hugo Award, if you are not familiar, is one of the most prestigious literary awards in the sci-fi and fantasy world. I hope you are now convinced. Uvho is a novel by English writer Hilary Mantel, published in 2009. It's a historical fiction about the rise of Thomas Cromwell in the court of Henry VIII. Who is Thomas Cromwell anyway? Why do I care about his story? <laughs> I had no idea who he was either and wasn't much interested. And it's a big book, but it won me over by its sheer brilliance. The Cardinal, writing, says without looking up, Thomas, still reigning, I expected you earlier. Boatman, raver, saint. He's been traveling since early morning and in the saddle for the best part of two weeks on the cardinal's business and has now come down by stages and not easy stages from Yorkshire. He's been to his clerks at Gray's Inn and borrowed a change of linen. He's been east to the city to hear what ships have come in and to check the whereabouts of an off the books consignment he is expecting. But he hasn't eaten and hasn't been home yet. The cardinal rises. He opens the door, speaks to his hovering servants. Cherries. What? No cherries? April, you say? Only April? We shall have sore work to placate my guests then. He sighs. Bring what you have, but you will never do, you know? Why am I so ill-served? Then the whole room is in motion. Food, wine, fire built up. A man takes his wet out garments with a solicitous murmur. All the cardinal's household servants are like this, comfortable, soft-footed, and kept permanently apologetic and teased. And all the cardinal's visitors are treated in the same way. If you had interrupted him every night for ten years and sat sulking and scowling at him at each occasion, you would still be his honoured guest. The servant efface themselves, melting away towards the door. What else would you like? The cardinal says. The sun to come out? So late, you tax my powers. Dawn would do. 
the cardinal inclines his head to the servant. I shall see to this request myself, he says gravely, and gravely they murmur and withdraw. The cardinal joins his hands. He makes a great, deep, smiling sigh, like a leopard settling in a warm spot. He regards his man of business. His man of business regards him. The cardinal, at 55, is still as handsome as he was in his prime. Tonight, he is dressed not in his everyday scarlet, but in blackish purple and fine white lace, like a humble bishop. His height impresses. His belly, which should in justice belong to a more sedentary man, is merely another princely aspect of his being. And on it, confidingly, he often rests a large, white, beringed hand. A large head, surely designed by God to support the papal tiara, is carried superbly on broad shoulders, shoulders upon which rest, though not at this moment, the great chain of Lord Chancellor of England. The head inclines, the cardinal says, in those honeyed tongues, famous from here to Vienna. So now, tell me how was Yorkshire? I loved it. This was my first reading experience where I don't feel like the characters are actors in period drama costumes. They talk and think and feel like us. They do not know who lives, who dies tomorrow because they are not stiff portraits in history books. They are just living their lives and navigating in the midst of a hurricane. For me, Thomas Cromwell lives in that world even now. I open the pages, he'll meet me there. That's why I keep putting off reading the last book in the series. I know he's executed in history, but he's still alive as long as I don't read The Mirror and the Light, which is the third and the last in the series. And I've come to love him very much. I really can't bear the thought of a world without him. Wolfhall won the Booker Prize in 2009, and one of the judges said it was a contemporary novel, a modern novel, which happens to be set in the 16th century. This way of representing historical fiction is a lot more common in the last few years. The film Little Women, the TV series The Great, and Emily Dickinson all do that now. But reading Wolf Hall was my first experience. It was so fresh. I was amazed. This was my favorite novel in 2019, and every time I opened the pages, I could get into the head of Thomas Cromwell, look at the Tudor court, and love his love and hate his hate. Both Uwe Ho and the second one, Bring Up the Bodies, won Booker Prize. The Mirror and the Light was nominated. And Uwe Ho was one of the five shortlisted for the Golden Man Booker Prize in 2018, which awarded the best of Booker winners over the last 50 years. One day, I will reread Upo and bring up the bodies and eventually face the mirror and the light. Station Eleven is a novel by Canadian writer Emily St. John Mandel, published in 2014. Chapter One The king stood in a pool of blue light, unmoored. This was Act Four of King Lear, A Winter Night, at the Elgin Theatre in Toronto. Early in the evening, three little girls had played a clapping game on stage as the audience entered, childhood versions of Leah's daughters, and now they'd returned as hallucinations in a mad scene. The king stumbled and reached for them as they flitted here and there in the shadows. His name was Arthur Leander. He was 51 years old, and there were flowers in his hair. Dost thou know me? The actor playing Gloucester asked. I remember thy eyes well enough, Arthur said, distracted by the child version of Cordelia, and this was when it happened. There was a change in his face. He stumbled. He reached for a column, but misjudged the distance, and struck it hard with the side of his hand. Down from the waist they are centaurs, he said. And not only was this the wrong line, but the delivery was wheezy, his voice barely audible. He cradled his hand to his chest like a broken bird. The act portraying Edgar was watching him closely. 
It was still possible at that moment that Arthur was acting. But in the first row of the orchestra section, a man was rising from his seat. He'd been training to be a paramedic. The man's girlfriend tugged at his sleeve, hissing, Jivan, what are you doing? And Jivan himself wasn't sure at first. The rows behind him murmuring from him to sit. And Asha was moving towards him. Snow began to fall over the stage. The wren goes to it, Arthur whispered. And Jivan, who knew the play very well, realised that the actor had skipped back twelve lines. The wren. Sir, the usher said, would you please? But Arthur Leander was running out of time. He swayed, his eyes unfocused, and it was obvious to Jivan that he wasn't Leah anymore. Jivan pushed the usher aside and made a dash for the steps leading up to the stage, but a second usher was jogging down the aisle, which forced Jivan to throw himself at the stage without the benefit of stairs. It was higher than he'd stopped, and he had to kick the first usher, who'd grasped hold of his sleeve. The snow was plastic. Jivan noted peripherally little bits of translucent plastic clinging to his jacket and brushing against his skin. Edgar and Gloucester were distracted by the commotion, neither of them looking at Arthur, who was leaning on a plywood column, staring vacantly. There were shouts from backstage, two shadows approaching quickly, but Jivan had reached Arthur by now, and he caught the actor as he lost consciousness, eased him gently to the floor. The snow was falling fast around them, shimmering in blue-white light. Arthur wasn't breathing. The two shadows, security men, had stopped a few paces away, presumably catching on by now that Jivan wasn't a deranged fan. The audience was a clamour of voices, flashes from cell phone cameras, indistinct exclamations in the dark. Jesus Christ, Edgar said. Oh, Jesus. He dropped the British accent he'd been using earlier and now sounded as if he were from Alabama, which in fact he was. Gloucester had pulled away the gold bandage that had covered half his face. By this point in the play, his character's eyes had been put out and seemed frozen in place his mouth opening and closing like a fish. Arthur's heart wasn't beating. Jeevan began CPR. Someone shouted an order and the curtain dropped. A whoosh of fabric and shadow that removed the audience from the equation and reduced the brilliance of the stage by half. The plastic snow was still falling. A few paragraphs later, someone finally succeeded in turning off the snow the last few translucency drifting down. Jivan was looking for the easiest way to exit the scene when he heard a whimper, and there was a child whom he'd noticed earlier, a small actress kneeling on the stage beside the next pine wood pillar to his left. Jivan had seen the play four times, but never before with children, and he thought it an innovative bit of staging. The girl was seven or eight, he kept wiping her eyes in a motion that left streaks of makeup on both her face and the back of her hand. Clear, one of the medics said, and the other moved back while he shocked the body. Hello, Jivan said to the girl. He knelt before her. Why had no one come to take her away from all this? She was watching the medics. He had no experience with children, although he'd always wanted one or two of his own, and wasn't exactly sure how to speak to them. Clear, the medic said, again. You don't want to look at that, Jivan said. He's going to die, isn't he? She was breathing in little sobs. I don't know. He wanted to say something reassuring, but he had to concede that it didn't look good. Arthur was motionless on the stage, shocked twice. Water holding the man's wrist and staring grimly into the distance while he waited for a pause. What's your name? Kirsten, the girl said. I'm Kirsten Raymond. The stage makeup was disconcerting. Kirsten, Jeevan said. Where's your mom? A few paragraphs later again. In the children's dressing room, Tanya was giving Kirsten a paperweight. Here, she said as she placed it into Kirsten's hands. I'm going to keep trying to reach your parents, 
and you just try to stop crying and look at this pretty thing. And Kirsten, teary-eyed and breathless, a few days shy of her eighth birthday, gazed at the object and thought it was the most beautiful, the most wonderful, the strangest thing anyone had ever given her. It was a lump of glass with a storm cloud trapped inside. In the lobby, the people gathered at the bar clinked their glasses together. To Arthur, they said. They drank for a few more minutes and then went their separate ways in a storm. Of all of them there at the bar that night, the bartender was the one who survived the longest. He died three weeks later on the road out of the city. What an ending to the chapter. The combination of the story and her writing style is perfect and the result is so beautiful. Her writing style is cold and clear and often reminds me of a winter sky. Again, I try not to spoil the story. This is a dystopian novel about a world before, during and after a devastating pandemic. When the world as we know it is plunged into the dark, how would humanity respond collectively and what would individuals do to survive? What in the society and culture would disappear and what would remain? Would people who are born and grow up during the collapse still know King Lear? I felt so sad and devastated about the collapse as it's called in the novel, but magically at the same time I felt surprisingly hopeful. It was my favourite novel of 2023. It triggered complicated feelings reading it post-Covid. Some of the scenes are all too uncomfortably realistic. I wonder what she thought, the author thought, living through the 2020 pandemic six years after writing this novel. It brought to my mind once again the fear of uncertainty for the future, the fear of sickness and death. How much worse is this going to get? How much longer is this going to last? But there's friendship, kindness, self-sacrifice, stories and music. It brought tears to my eyes. I had to pause often to savor the moment. Just me and this sad wreckage but breathtakingly beautiful world. Transcendent Kingdom is a novel by Ghanaian-American author Ya Jasi, published in 2020. This is the latest in terms of publication date. This is probably also the least well-known. Chapter 1. Whenever I think of my mother, I picture a queen-sized bed with her lying in it. A practiced stillness filling the room. For month on end, she colonized that bed like a virus. The first time when I was a child, and then again when I was a graduate student. The first time I was sent to Ghana to wait her out. While there, I was walking through Kajetia Market with my aunt, when she grabbed my arm and pointed. Look, a crazy person, she said in tree. Do you see? A crazy person. I was mortified. My aunt was speaking so loudly, and the man, tall with dust caked into his dreadlocks, was within earshot. I see, I see, I answered in a low hiss. The man continued past us, mumbling to himself as he waved his hands about in gestures that only he could understand. My aunt nodded, satisfied, and we kept walking past the hordes of people gathered in the agoraphobia-inducing market until we reached the store where we would spend the rest of the morning attempting to sell knock-off handbags. In my three months there, we only sold four bags. Even now, I don't completely understand why my aunt singled the man out to me. Maybe she thought there were no crazy people in America that I had never seen one before. Or maybe she was thinking about my mother, about the real reason I was stuck in Ghana that summer, sweating in a store with an aunt I hardly knew while my mother healed at home in Alabama. I was 11 and I could see that my mother wasn't sick, not in the ways that I was used to. I didn't understand what my mother needed healing from. I didn't understand, but I did. 
and my embarrassment at my aunt's loud gesture had as much to do with my understanding as it did with the man who had passed us by. My aunt was saying, that, that is what crazy looks like. But instead, what I heard was my mother's name. What I saw was my mother's face, still as lake water, the pastor's hand resting gently on her forehead, his prayer a light hum that made the room buds. I'm not sure I know what crazy looks like, but even today when I hear the word, I picture a split screen, the dreadlocked man in Kajetia on one side, my mother lying in bed on the other. I think about how no one at all reacted to that man in the market, not in fear or disgust, nothing, save my aunt, who wanted me to look. He was, it seemed to me, at perfect peace, even as he gesticulated wildly, even as he mumbled. But my mother, in her bed, infinitely still, was wild inside. Chapter 2 the second time it happened, I got a phone call while I was working in my lab at Stanford. I'd had to separate two of my mice because they were ripping each other to bits in that shoebox of a home we kept them in. I found a piece of flesh in one corner of the box, but I couldn't tell which mouth it came from at first. Both were bleeding and frenzied, scurrying away from me when I tried to grab them even though there was nowhere to run. Look, Gifty. She hasn't been to church in nearly a month. I've been calling the house, but she won't pick up. I go by sometimes and make sure she's got food and everything, but I think, I think it's happening again. I didn't say anything. The mice had calmed down considerably, but I was still shaken by the sight of them and worried about my research, worried about everything. Gifty, Pastor John said, she should come stay with me. I'm not sure how the pastor got my mother on the plane. When I picked her up at SFO, she looked completely vacant, her body limp. I imagined Pastor John folding her up the way you would a jumpsuit, arms crossed about the chest in an X, legs put up to meet them, then tucking her safely into a suitcase complete with a handle with care sticker before passing her off to the flight attendant. I gave her a stiff hug and she shrunk from my touch. I took a deep breath. Did you check a bag? I asked. The protagonist is called Gifty. Chapter 1 gives us many hints. The novel is about the mother-daughter relationship, her mother's mental illness and the impact on their life, Gifty's sense of identity and self-knowledge rooted in both her native country as well as the US where she lives now, about her Christian upbringing as well as her work as a neuroscientist, about her struggle forward through hardship in life. She opens up and tells me about her life since childhood and she shows me her vulnerability and pain openly. Um, after I finished reading the book, I wrote a letter telling her how much I appreciated her sharing her story to Gifty, not the author. You can hear me read it out in this video. I will link it in the description box too. I had never done that before and I haven't since. I wanted to be her friend, give her a hug and tell her how brave and good she has been and she's not alone, we can work it out together. For all of them, if you are vaguely interested, how about download a free Kindle sample to read a couple of chapters on the free Kindle app on your phone and see if you like it or not. I hope you will find a new favourite. I'd also love to hear what are your favorite novels from the last 24 years. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in my next one.